Okay, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm here with Brad, who some of you will know from the comments or from Karen's channel. For those of you that don't know Brad, I wanted to see if he could give us a quick introduction, how he got here, maybe just a little bit also what you do now. I, I know that you're involved with horses, but you also have your your other job. Um, it intrigued me a lot, so let us know. Okay. Yeah, my name is Brad Bilski. I, uh, I live in Pennsylvania in the United States, and I came to this little corner through Jordan Peterson. I started following him in 2016, um, and then, but it was prior to the, even the C-16 bill that he was all in the news about. Um, and then through him, I just started listening to a lot of his lectures and then got involved with watching Paul Vanderclay. I watched Paul's very first videos about Peterson right when he released them and been involved in this since the very beginning. And then through all that and the, and the people that Paul talked to, I, um, you know, different people started different channels. And so I've really been involved with Karen's channel a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I like a lot of what she's trying to do and, and the guests she has and how I love how her mind works, how she can piece things together that yeah. uh, a lot of people don't see how all that macro fits together, but she sees it somehow. And I, I love that about her. I guess I do too, but not, not like she does. <laughs> um, so, and then through Karen's channel, I think you, you were on there um, going over some book reviews and that's how I came across your channel. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today. I think that, that you're doing things uh, that are I don't know. I just think they're exciting to me to think about. Mm -hmm. And some of your guests that you have on really, it's amazing to me how, I don't want to say the word smart, but how um, like curious people are in this little corner and how yeah. far they're going and digging down into things. It's, it, it's really amazing to me. You yeah. know, I never thought this would exist. There's only been a handful of people I ever met in my life that really have this kind of curiosity and, and an openness to learn. So mm -hmm. that's what I love about it. And yeah. then I, I do mechanical design work as my day job. Um, I've been doing that for 35 years, I design automation equipment okay. and product design. And um, for a while I was training horses. My wife and I had a farm and we, um, we had a, we had a young colt and we had to train it. So I ended up learning how to train horses. So that, that really illuminated a lot of some of the things I want to discuss today. Mm. So I don't know, we can, uh, we can get started, I guess. I That's don't know beautiful. if there's anything you wanted to add or, or yeah. bring into before we start. No, I, just, I think, um, well, I have horses here at my parents' house. I'm here just for the night. And um, for the entirety of my life, I never connected with them. I never tried because when, once one of them stepped on my foot when I was a young kid. Um, and you sent me a video of someone who, who also trains horses and who found, I guess, a, I don't know, did, do you think he found a spiritual transformation through that? Is that fair to say? or? Um, I think he probably found a spiritual trans transformation. I don't know yeah. if it was the original one, but he certainly, uh, and that's similar to me. I had been a Christian for uh, 20 years before I started training horse, 25 years before I started yeah. training horses. And it really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I didn't see before. Yeah. How, yeah. how, how relationships, how they work, I yeah. guess, and how you have to attend to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, <clears throat> I kind of wanted to talk today about story, but it's all, all of this is going to be related. Um, have you ever heard the word anthology? The English I have. Word? Okay. I'm trying to think what it, what it would mean. I looked it up in Dutch. Bloemlezing. Bloemlezing. Yeah. So it's like a collection of stories. Uh huh. Is that the right word? That's what it came up in the translator. I'm trying. I don't know what about bloom means flower. How do you spell bloom? Uh, with a, a B L O E M. Yeah. It means flower. Yeah, flower. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know what it means. And when I did look that up, it kind of gave that impression that it's like a, it's like a collection of something yeah. beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a bouquet maybe. I can you know? see. Yeah. I can see. 
You can so see that's, that's, uh, that's something I wanted to, to kind of bring to the table. This is something I've been thinking about for a long time. And you're mm -hmm. somebody I thought that I could talk to about this and maybe we could tease this out a little bit Dude. because I kind of see us, each one of us as an anthology, we're a collection of stories. Mm -hmm. We're not a story. We, I mean, we are in a sense, there's kind of a overarching, but really when you get down to who we are, there's a, there's a several stories, multiple stories that make us up. And each one of those stories is actually a relationship mm. and it's a relationship to other, other people. I mean, that could be one, one type of story. And even, even in that context, sometimes we're not the lead character. Sometimes they are, uh, another person is, mm -hmm. um, we also have relationships with things that um, aren't animate or, you know, a relationship to food or yeah. alcohol or things like that. So there's a lot of things that, that make up who we are. And then within some of these relationships, I think there's, there's like fractal stories. So how I relate to anger or how I relate to fear manifests in these stories. Mm -hmm but it isn't always the same. Like you, you and I could have a relationship and how my fear manifest manifests in it is completely different than how it does with my wife. Yeah. So <clears throat> as we start to unpack all these things, uh, it becomes really difficult to, um, to, to, it's not predictable. Yeah. There's, there's too many variables involved. Too many variables, even if you understand how you deal with fear, you're going to end up pushed up against it. And that's, that's what I was wanting to really point out in that horse video that I showed you. And what that trainer does is he, he was taking that horse in a controlled environment and pushing it up against its fear. Not so much the horse would fight back, you know, but it just take it to that edge and then mm. Be that source of relief that the horse would draw to that trainer. Mm. So it, it builds that relationship. And you do that multiple times, then it becomes um, a way for trust to be built. That the horse can trust that you'll work it through its sphere mm. without punishment, without um, any kind of coercion. It's it's a it's a patient, loving attention to what the horse is going through but then through all that the horse becomes something more than it could have ever dreamed that it could be yeah that's that's what he said as well he said that yeah. the horse on its own could never get to where the horse could get to if it was with me and and for people listening i'll put it in the description if you want to watch it's yeah a very beautiful beautiful video yeah there's uh i was gonna see if there's um so I want to share my screen here because I did, I designed machines and this is something else that came into my mind uh, years ago when I started doing this, that, that we really have some fractal patterns going on that go, that go, they run pretty deep and, and they're everywhere. So this machine, if, if you think of it, can you see that? All right. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. So this is a machine that, that puts together a, uh, it puts together a map light for Chevrolet and GMC pickup trucks. The, the actual products it, it's out of um, it's obsolete. Now the, the model year ran out, so they don't make this anymore. So I'm free to show this with you. There's a lot of confidentiality that goes with this stuff. So there's, there's a machine here, but it's, it's like an anthology. This level of the machine is the whole machine together, but then within in the machine, you can see these, different uh, sub assemblies are going to highlight and yeah. these, su these sub assemblies, that's like the electrical controls. There's a, there's a sub assembly here that, and what this is doing, it's an assembly machine. So, uh, this takes a part and loads it into a fixture and then this machine indexes to the next point. And so it just, uh, it's a continuous progressive assembly yeah. sorry this is really taxing my video card so <laughs> um so we have these sub assemblies and then if i open up one of them you'll see that in within that there are sub assemblies within that 
And so I, when I started doing this job a long time ago, it really started to become apparent to me that this is like how we are. Yeah. So we have that anthology. We have, we have the, you can see this is the part that gets wow. loaded into the, into the fixture. Um, That's crazy. And these are like gripper jaws that pick it up. And this is all cam actuated motion that, that loads the part in. So it's like a, a U shape upside down. U picks it uh -huh. out of this spot, picks it up, places it here. I actually have a video of this too. I could maybe show, but I don't want to do it while this is open. <laughs> <laughs> It'll definitely crash. So, I, so think, cool, I, I think that, uh, I mean, everyone's smart enough to understand what I'm trying to get across here is that there's a, there are multiple levels of things yeah. within us. Absolutely. And I guess one of the things that um, I'm going to stop sharing this for now. So one of the things that really kind of um, that I wanted to talk to you about is we talk a lot and we use the, 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 the good, the true and the beautiful as being something that's going to, you know, lead us to meaning lead mm -hmm. us out of to lead to transformation yeah and so over the past several months i kind of been trying to think about well what what is that what is the good the true and the beautiful and i started to like think about the machines i design i thought about horses about relationships and it seems to me that the good is the proper relationship between things mm -hmm. and that the truth is that that is proper through time, mm -hmm. not just going forward, but backwards too. It's, okay. it's true. It's always been true and it's true now and it always will be true. It's just true. And then the beautiful is the manifestation of the, of the relationship. So yes. we see that, we see that in art, you know, and then in a way that machine has a beauty to it um, because everything fits together and works. Yeah. And, and so if our, if our stories inside us, the anthology that, that all these stories make up, I really want to make those stories good, true, and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's alignment, right? Yeah. So how, how do we make that happen? You know, it's uh, <laughs> so we have a lot of um, we have more information than we've ever had mm -hmm. as, as human beings. And I have access to things now I never even dreamt I'd have access to. But one thing I've noticed, it's not really changed how I approach these relationships. There's a yeah. there's a there's a patience to it. There's a. And I kind of thinking about stories, the story that you always have like a, um, you always have a goal. The character has a goal or mm -hmm. some kind of desire. Yeah. Or, or maybe you're looking for meaning. You're trying to find meaning in something. As you go into the story with this preconceived idea, there's, there's a surrender at some point. And then there's a transformation of your, relationship to that desire or to that goal and that pattern seems to play out on all these stories that i have in my life i don't know have you ever noticed that or thought of thought about that like how how the structures of stories are a good story and yeah. I, I think that maybe we should <laughs> point that out too because <laughs> i think a good story is something that is transformative in a way that makes you free yeah to, and then a bad story is like a spell. Yeah. So, so the question is, have I, have I seen that pattern of a good story? And then you wanted to say, yeah. And like in your life, how does that play out for you? Um, when you so, know it's right. Yes. Okay. So you're asking how it plays out in my life when, when the, when the story is right. Well, for one, it, it feels as if I'm participating in something beyond myself. Whereas if I don't align myself with that, I feel more of an idiosyncratic existence, if you know what I mean. When 
I align myself, I feel that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm in harmony somehow. And in a way it feels effortless because I'm submitting myself to it. Right. That's interesting. Cause that, that's pretty much how I feel slightly yeah. different words, but, um, you talked to your brother, you had the video up last week, I think about, and you, you, you were discussing a little bit about free will and determinism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I almost typed it in the comments, but it was just too hard to really explain it. I thought about it a little bit more, but it's, uh, when you enter into a relationship, you're in an arena and you're an agent, but the other person's an agent too. Mm. So think about like maybe your fiance did, is she determining who you are? In some ways she is. Yeah. And in some ways you're determining who she is. Yeah. So there's both free will and determined being determined at play because there's another agent involved. Yeah. So if you have, uh, I don't know. So if you have, if you're by yourself on a deserted Island, you can live like Sauron. <laughs> <laughs> you can get away with it. Yeah. Right. But as soon as another person's involved that now there's, there's, I mean, you can still be a tyrant, but now you're going to have to impose that on them. Mm. And so, so it becomes a dance and this, the submission to that de being determined yeah, and through, yes. and, and through that you become transformed into something both of you couldn't be by yourself. Yes. So this goes back to the horse and yeah. this idea that, that you submit yourself to something higher that can allow you to flourish even more than you would on your own. And it's the same idea that pops up into my mind where um, I often think about libertarian ideas and, you know, I'm involved with like the Bitcoin community and they are speaking about freedom as if it's like the, the best possible thing. But at some point, where does that freedom lead to if it's not in service of something higher? Right. So that yeah. that's, that's what we're looking for. Or where it intersects with your vices. Yeah. <laughs> then it's not so good. No, um, exactly. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's exactly how I view it. And I kind of, I thought that's how you would answer because I, I can see the way you talk to other people and some of the things, you know, your comments and things that um, you have a similar thought process there. Yeah. And then um, I thought I'd kind of probe a little bit into some of these stories we have because so our, like you're a son, but you're a son to, to your mother and your father. So you're really two sons because you have mm -hmm. two different relationships. Yeah. One with each one, right? I have two daughters and I have two different relationships. So I'm, I'm two fathers really. Mm. And, and they're not the same. And I don't know how your relationship is with your parents. I'm not going to pry, but I can kind of share a little bit with my daughters. My, my oldest daughter is 34. My youngest is 26. And my oldest daughter, ha we have been, our story has gone through the hero's journey multiple times. And each one of us has gone through the hero's journey multiple times in the context of that story. And right now it is absolutely beautiful. The prayers that I had prayed over her for 34 years have been answered um, just recently in the past few weeks, things that wow. her, and, her and I are able to talk about. Um, so our relationship is really good. Now, my younger daughter, we've gone through the multiple, uh, heroes journeys in our, in that story as well. Right now it's not, it's not at a good spot. It's a, it's kind of in the chaos. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so am I a good father or a bad father? I mean, you, uh, <laughs> when you look, when you, if you look at this, it's um, it's easy to get bogged down by some, like if you have a story that isn't doing well, you trying to, it spills into the other ones when it really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you have that 
yeah. happen to you sometimes, but it can get, especially if it's a really important story to you. Yes. I understand what you're saying. So it can really, um, it can have a, a detrimental effect. Yeah. I've so, so, so through the, uh, I guess through the years and maturing as a person, I've, I've been able to more keep it isolated. Like, okay, this, this is something that I have to work on. I need to, you know, pray about this or seek wisdom from somebody else or whatever, whatever God leads me to try and do to, 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 to make this good and beautiful again. Um, not that it's horrible. I don't want to make it sound like it's, it's terrible. It's just not where it has been in the past. You yeah. Know? And it's in a little, there's, there's a chaos, a little chaos going on there, <laughs> which is something. I think that you what do you watch Peugeot at all? Yes. So I think one thing that it was a long time ago, but he did like a, an image of everything and it was like the mountain of God and there's, there's the garden of Eden or, you know, God's at the top and then down at yes. the bottom, there's a, there's a serpent around the bottom, that chaos. And I think that that kind of fractal or that image is fractal and it goes into every single relationship we have and that there's a potential for chaos. So the harmony's there when it's good, but fear or some other anomaly or, or something interferes with that harmony and, and chaos comes into it. And that's another thing you saw in that horse video. So when he would, do something with that horse that pushed it up against its fear. Chaos would come into the, into that, into that relationship. Yes. And it, what's nice, or I think what's amazing about the horses, is it's, it's, you can visually see it. And so it makes you aware of it. Yes. So, so you can see that with them, but you can also, then when you imagine that you see that, well, that happens with people too. Mm. That doesn't play out that way where it's that, that visual, but the chaos comes into the relationship the same way. And um, so <laughs> one of the things that's kind of, I, I'm going to share my screen again, because this is kind of funny, I think, because I've been, I've been trying to think of a visual way to describe this. And I'm going to try with this. Can you see this? I can see it. So it's a YouTube video. You can yep. look these up. There's all kinds of them. This is a pendulum. And so this guy's going to swing this pendulum. So this is cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? And this is what we want our lives to be like. Now he's going to he's going to decouple this. There's actually two two arms to this pendulum. I see. But he's going to wire or zip tie them together so that there's still one. So now you still have this going on, but there's only one degree of freedom. Yeah. Right. So basically this is like a master and a slave. So this is still like a Sauron moment here mm -hmm. <laughs> where everyone's <laughs> bent to the will of the, of the main pendulum arm. Yeah. And now what he does is he decouples them. Oh, wow. So now it actually, this is actually chaos. <laughs> this is unpredictable. And this is when two people are in a relationship, <laughs> mm. right? Let's see. So it just now this is a, this is a three arm. Yeah. This is kind of interesting because he's showing what can happen is there is a, uh, there is harmony here in, in the way. So you can find harmony in a relationship with, with more than one yeah 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 but then he takes it into chaos here like uh pretty pretty aggressive chaos here but this this is just totally random now yeah so that's what happens i think when uh we're in a relationship and so i don't know if you and your fiance have tried to do a budget together <laughs> but when you do this will happen <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Well, it happens yeah. even like at a legislative level when yeah. they're trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, chaos ensues because everyone has different values over what they should be spending their money on. Right. Yeah. 
So, um, you know the the story about Jesus when he went. The the, the disciples were on the uh, boat on the Sea of Galilee, and then he he walked out on that water, and the storm's raging, and he walks out, and Peter comes out of the boat and stuff. But so if you think about that as chaos. that we have the ability to not be affected by it. Mm. And that, that like the horse trainer with the horse, when he's there with it, he's acting like Jesus is on, on, so I don't know if you can say, hang on. My YouTube went off. Um, he has the ability to act as Jesus on the water. So yeah. the chaos, the chaos is, is the water. That's kind of what's going on there. And, uh, and those horses, when you're dealing with that horse, you're trying to give them something that's stable. I, I think that we, we bring that, or we can bring that into our relationships. And I think we help each other do that. Like sometimes if I overreact to something, my wife can, uh, can bring that stability. Yeah. And this might sound silly, but my dog does that too. Yeah. My dog can actually <laughs> tell, she can tell when I'm upset before I, I know, before yeah. I realize it, she'll come over to me and she's like, did I do something wrong? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. The dog can pick up on it. You know? Yeah. I know you have a, it's a mixed breed. It's part lab, but our dog's a yeah. lab. And she seems so sensitive to those things. No, so, ours too. Ours too, for sure. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. But we, we can do that with each other. And so I think these stories are what we're supposed to focus our creativity on. Like that's, that's the main objective of our creativity is to yeah. bring that into these stories yeah. of, of our life. And to try the, I mean, what is the upward limit if we try to make them as good and true, as beautiful as, as we possibly can? Yeah, there is none. I'm, we would be the limit, I would think. Either yeah. either me or the, or the other person, um, because there there are there is resistance to this too, you know. And sometimes change takes a long time. Transformation. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with letting go of those desires and goals. Um, you know, that surrender that has to happen before the transformation that yeah. can take, it can take a long time. So do you think the same, um, concept applies beyond human relationships? Do you, do you handle relationships with other things as you mentioned before the same manner or how is it, is it somehow different? No, it, it is a similar, it is similar. Okay. There's, um, like with animals, with, um, with creation in general. So I have uh, a, a deep love for, um, for the forests, you know, for, for streams and creeks and rivers. And, and just, I mean, that part of my story is that really helped me get through some hard times when I was young, being, be having access to that, to the nature to nature and, and to God's creation and be there is where I could find peace. Same. And so I, I have that affection, a deep affection for it. Um, but I don't, I don't know. It's hard because when I try to talk to, to the, to Christians about that, sometimes it's not received very well. And I don't understand that, but um, it's almost like they're so afraid of worshiping nature that it isn't, it, it isn't uh, admired at all. I don't know. It's kind yeah. of strange. It's kind of, you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause I, I have a, uh, I, Dolly went through uh, a book. This, this book here, actually, it'll probably be backwards, but it's a hidden life of trees. Yeah. Dolly read through this book. And when she was doing that, I'm like, uh, I, I want to talk about these things with, people you know but i i have a hard time talking about that with christians mm. and i shouldn't 
because we're in relationship and it's some of the stories that are part of me. I, I can't hide that, you know? Yeah. So when I read through the book myself too, and um, you know, he gives a lot of scientific explanations about how trees communicate with each other. <laughs> Cause this, this might sound really strange, but my wife and I own property up in New York and um, it's 38 acres. So it's pretty large and there's nice, it's most of it's wooded. And um, I've spent hours in that woods hours. I just love going there. And last fall, I went up there with my brother and we were cutting brush on the trails and I walked into my favorite part of our, of our woods and it felt off to me. There was something not, not the same. And I could tell. And as I'm talking to my brother about it, I, I look on the ground and there's these tiny, it looks like shredded coconut, really small white. I didn't know what it was. So I got down on my hands and knees and I'm looking at this and I had to get my phone. It was really small, you know, to zoom in on it and look and, and here it's some kind of insect. Mm. And I, I took pictures of them. And I, I looked it up when I got home and here it's an invasive species mm. of, a, of aphid. And that section of the woods where I was in her, uh, it was all Canadian hemlock trees. So they're, they're a conifer and those aphids like bore in at the base of the needle and then they extract the sap. And so it, it hurts the trees. And so I could tell that was going on somehow. Uh, but when I reading this book, scientifically, when a tree is being um, attacked, it releases chemicals and those chemicals signal to the trees around them something yes. something's yeah. here so they can mount a defense against it so that they don't all fall victim to it <laughs> and so me being able to sense that something was different isn't it's it's plausible right? yeah of course but I, it, what i thought was strange it's like i almost needed to have permission to think that and i don't know why <laughs> i don't know why why would why would i i could tell but it's like, it seems like woo if you talk about it without knowing why, you know? Yeah. So to, that's a long answer to your question. I do try to be in relationship with, I guess, everything you can be. Yeah. You know? um, because everything's connected. I think, I think you're seeing that too, right? Yeah. So <laughs> the machine that I showed you, you know, that, that designs or that, that design assembles automotive parts and I've, I've designed, I don't even know how many machines now, but I'm starting to have a harder time with that because I've seen like what a factory looks like and how many parts come in and out of that in a day. And you, you, you can't even fathom in your mind where they all go, you know? So it's like um, the consumption side mm. of things is kind of starting to, I don't know, make me think about things differently. You mean it, it takes on proportions that are like so overwhelming? Yeah. When you see it at scale. Yeah. It, it's, it's just it's crazy. You know, so like I've been in factories where I design a machine like that and there's 50 machines like that in the factory and they have semi after semi backing up unloading raw material. They're being, they're uh, injection molding the parts. They're putting them in the machines and then machine or semi after semi going out, you know? And so it, it's hard to imagine. And that's just one company, you know, yeah. how, how all of that, I don't know. I mean, it's not like, it's not like I want to see everyone go back to hunter gatherers, but I think there's a, some kind of balance in between. That yeah. we're, kind of, we're kind of missing right now. Yeah. Harmony. 
Yeah. I find it so difficult. Well, I think about this a lot and I have all these voices in my head of different people that I've listened to over the years, express different ideas about it. And I always just find a hubris in my own thoughts very quickly. Sometimes they're not even my own where I, I think of one viewpoint and I'm like, well, doesn't that mean if, if I want to prohibit certain technological developments or if I want to go back to a more natural way, doesn't that also mean that I'm impeding people from living like that big numbers of people, but then we're not exactly in harmony. Could you get in harmony in a different way? Like, are there certain things that maybe we should just never do? Like, I don't know. Should we cap ourselves in, in some way technologically? These are all questions I ask myself all the time. And I, I'm not finding a lot of answers. I do think there are certain principles that I think are helpful where you try to not cause people's lives to be in danger. Like I think nature is very important to me, but Peterson often speaks about different conceptions of nature. Like you can look at nature as the, the, the virgin, you know, who's <laughs> like pure and innocent and you have to protect, uh, protect her at all costs. And then you also have another view of nature and nature is actually also dangerous. And I think it's somewhere in between. So that means that we should be allowed to be sort of a, a shepherd over it, not be consumed by it, but also not destroy it, I guess. We're also dependent on it. So it would be stupid. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I just, it's how do, how do you pull that off? Yeah. See, that's, that's, that's the thing because you can see where the WEF is what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's the top down. We're going to force us on everyone and whoever dies, dies, I guess, you know? Yeah. That, yeah. <clears throat> but that, that's not obviously not the correct answer. The other thing is to just let it run its course, which I don't think part, part of what the problem is. I, I don't, we can't, comprehend we don't get the feedback to comprehend what we're actually doing mm -hmm. i think people would make better decisions if they knew what what the impact was but it, how do you know i mean it's so because everything is um you know with the division of labor and and everything and like the fisheries and what's going on in the ocean you don't know what what's going on out there no you know? it'd be impossible um, right so that's kind of what i've been uh you know like peterson always talks about cleaning your room and i've been thinking about like cleaning up our stories yeah and if we do if we do that as individuals we have it's it's a network because like i'm connected to my wife and she's connected to people she works with you know and so there's it, it there's creates a, a network just because of how how our stories are all interconnected yes. and, and that I think that's where the, like the good, the true and the beautiful, it attracts people. So if they see that, um, we're going to be drawn to it. Yeah. And that's the way we fix it. And I think that's, I think maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but Paul Kingsnorth is kind of on that same, he has that same idea. Cause he used to be an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of helped me work through some of that too. It's uh, it's, it's up to me, but not, not completely. Yeah. Even if it was, I wouldn't know what to do. So we don't really have much choice, but to, I mean, honestly, I think the same, the same answer is true with, uh, with Bitcoin or finances. It's uh, it's something that happens, like starts with me and how I interact with, with people. Um, and through that, we find that equilibrium. Yeah. You harmonize your own life before right. the rest of the world harmonizes, I guess. Yeah. But that's scary because, <laughs> but it's, it, it's less scary than tyranny <laughs> and less scary than doing nothing. So, yeah, exactly. It's, it would be too much to focus on to 
to have the responsibility of the whole world. And given that we're just human beings ourselves, to, to start with ourselves is extremely helpful. And like you said, it is interconnected. I like the word fractal as well. Idea that, well, you have to start with yourself and then it can replicate on a larger scale. And that's why I think Peugeot says that it's important to be as saint-like as possible. If you really right. want to help the world be the best person you can be. Right. Right. So that's, that's what, uh, how, the, how does that actually play out on our life though? It's kind of like, you can say that as a, you know, a sweeping broad sweeping statement, but how do you actually do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's incremental and it's especially important to look at where you're at right now. So you're not going to be a saint tomorrow. No one is, but you can be better. That's how I always think about it. Right. I'm never going to attain to the level of Christ, but I can try to get closer to him. Right. And that's where I, uh, so that incremental is in this, right in the stories. That's, that's where it manifests. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where God is. I think I really do. I think we're, two or more gathered in my name, there I am in their midst, that same idea that Rebecca is talking about with yeah. the top in there. Yeah. And that, um, let me, let me, let me say this, maybe just so I can sort this out in my head a little bit. When we're, our very first relationship that we have, the very first story we have is with our mother. And then the second relationship is generally our father, but it's, it's later. It's after that. Right. And if you think about us being the union of, of heaven and earth, we're born in the material world first. And then we're born from above. Yeah. Later. And that, then that union of the two is when we start understanding the relationships between things. And, um, so when, when that agape comes into these relationships we have, it shapes, it shapes them. It helps shape them. So you have that, you have that, your, your perspective and the other agent or other person's perspective, but you try to look through the agape lens that God, the God gives you the vision to see it. I mean, we can't see it completely from outside, but he can, and he can lead us to where we need to surrender, where we need to stand our ground, where the boundary should be. And that kind of makes the, the process work towards the good. Yeah. But we can't, we can't be in control of that either. We're not, it's, it's something we surrender to more than we still have our free will and we still participate in it. Right. You willingly participate in it, but yeah, I had uh, our our grandkids stayed with us last week, and this is me. It's a simple story, so it'd be easy for me to explain it. I had this desire to like he's four, gonna be five soon. I wanted to start creating with him, and he's really interested in trucks and you know things. He likes uh, action figures and. So I have a 3D printing business that I uh, run with my engineering design, do prototyping and, and product, I print products and stuff with it too. And so I decided I was going to print something with them, you know, that I, we'd sit down together and we'd find something we wanted to do and, and then we would print it and we'd put it on the printer and overnight and then the next morning we could take it off and, you know, he could see it, but he could see the whole process of how we did it. And so that's what I had in my mind, what I was going well, the goal, that was the goal I had. And then as we went into this, <laughs> uh, we got, we, he wanted to make a little skeleton. So we put it on the printer and started printing it, got him to bed. 2.30 in the morning, he wakes up, comes in the room and gets me up. He's like, is it, is it time to get up yet? So he's excited about this. He wants it now, you know? So it, I didn't really think about it, but I kind of created this Christmas Eve 
<laughs> yeah. A dynamic for him. And he's excited. So it's, I mean, I'm glad he's excited about it, but then it turned into him waking up every 15 minutes. You know, he, he really didn't fall asleep. He just kept getting up, coming in with me and he was waking up his sister too. So it like turned into this, you know, he's, he's fixated on it and he's not being patient. And so I went in with him and I sat down on the edge of the bed and we were talking and just, it's like, I, I tried to, I prayed, God help me to understand what to do here because I could take this in a lot of different directions. Right. And I could be the tyrant. And this is how I was raised. It's like, you get in that bed, you be quiet and you don't get out of it until I come get you in the morning. And that would be it. Right. So that's making the pendulum one, one pendulum arm me. And then the other side of it, it's like, I, I have, it's printed, it's sitting on the kitchen counter. I could just go give it to him, but then it loses that teaching moment for him to work through something. So I didn't think either one would be good. So I, I just prayed about it and God's like, he needs patience, you know, and he needs, uh, he needs to um, just kind of be able to control himself here. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but I, I, I started to, to, to realize that that's what I needed in the situation too. So that little boy became a mirror that I got to see myself in and he's dealing with this. So God gave me, you know, you know the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. So God gives us that, but it's meant for other people. So in the process of doing this, him and I had a conversation and then I told him like, maybe think about other things and let's, I can tell you a story and maybe think about the story. And, and he started, no, okay, I, it's all right. I I'm, there's a story. I'll, I'll think of that. And he fell asleep next day we got up but this turned into uh <laughs> like the next day we we're talking to my daughter about it it's like yeah he's been having a hard time with fixation on things and the way i handled it was exactly how my daughter's handling it with him so he saw the same consistency so you kind of know that there's something gelling these things yeah. together because my daughter and i didn't talk about it but we came to the same conclusion and um so we, we talked together some more about it and that we're going to, next time we're going to work through this a little different, you know? And he, he was kind of, he just looked at me and he goes, Papa, I love you. You know? And it's like through all this, it's just a simple story, but it's like this pushed him up against some chaos that he had yeah. to work through. And when we came out the other side, our relationship's a little better and it's back in harmony again. Right. And it's just a little tiny story about how I had to give up and like my idea of what this was going to be about was 3d printing. And it turned out to be a story about patience. Yeah. You know, um, it's just amazing how that stuff works like that. And it, yeah. it happens all the time. So that's how I think we see God. Cause I invited God into it. And then I got to see myself in it and what I, what I needed, what he needed. And God gave us the answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel it as well. Just ask. I mean, it's really just about asking like, what is the best option and like, what is the best action to take? And I think there is always one. That's why you and your daughter came to the same conclusion because there right. is actually a path to take. And then right for him. Yes. For, for that little boy. It, at the current age he's at you know so that'll change as he grows up too though yeah. you know as he learns this stuff and and he becomes more and then it, then it may be more of a he's being defiant then he's just not sure how to handle himself right mm -hmm. then it cha changes the dynamic again so yeah. it's it's always dancing with this with an open heart and an open mind and and not uh i don't know not carrying preconceived ideas into it yeah it's a surrender. It's a surrender to a process that we don't completely understand. Yeah. I, I want to ask you a question because through this chaos, 
or you had a problem, you wanted to see the skeleton early, you grew your relationship with him and you you invited God into it. Do you think it's necessary for relationships to have that chaos and subsequently to to have God to to ask? Yes. I do. I, I think <laughs> that, uh, it's, but that's been my experience with, yeah. with relationships. It's because that's what, that's what pushes that brings the resistance into it. It's like, it's like working out. You, you have to have something that's challenging the current status quo. Mm -hmm. And so growth is going to require you to change. That's what the transformation is. So you have you have to have you have to have that. At least I think so. Yeah, especially in this existence. I mean, yeah, I don't right. know how it, how it looks. It may not be, you know, it could be an anomaly from outside. You know, um, someone you love dies. So I mean, there's a whole all different things that can happen. But you can willfully go into something too, right? Yeah. You could. When you get married, you're going to have a, a period of chaos until you adjust to each other. Um, like a budget is another, I mean, finances is probably the single biggest thing pe married people fight over, believe it or not, because it, it, um, you know, what are you going to spend it on, on the kids vacation, taking them on vacation, or are you going to, you know, put it towards their, um, education? There's all, all different types of values that, that come into that. And then even if you come to an agreement on what the budget's going to be, then the refrigerator breaks or the transmission goes out in the car. And so now you have an expense you didn't plan on, which you can budget for to some extent, but you know, that you might have to take money away from something that, so now it's another, another little, yeah, another little chaos uh, episode comes into the relationship, but working through those is what, makes them better yeah so in that sense they're opportunities they are you yeah. know if 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 it if you do get through it now yeah some people don't i mean and it ends up being a big issue and then that builds and and once a kind of that because i always kind of think of like the hero story and even in a relationship if you think about it when you look at it from the end, it's almost like the Ouroboros. You got that cycle that it's going through, but it's going through that cycle through time. So it's really like a helix, you know, it's a, like a spring. And if you look at it from the side, it looks like a waveform yeah. You're going through these peaks and valleys, but you have, you have to have that um, to grow. So you're, you're actually, it's like you're spiraling up. So it's like a thing. I like, I think of like a video game, you get through a level and then you fight the big boss and that, now you're at a higher level than where you were before. So you just mm. keep going, you just keep going up these, yeah. uh, these levels. Uh, you have setbacks too. Some, sometimes things can get undone, you know, trust can be broken. Um, there's a lot of things that happen. Relationships are extremely complicated. Yeah. So it's it's hard to. Uh, that's what I mean. It's hard for us. That's why I showed you those pendulums because we we kind of think of it. At least I used to think of it like just you know it's, it's cause and effect. Two people come together and it, but it isn't. It's there's a lot more going on. Mm -hmm. So. Can I ask you, were you were you raised as a as a Christian? No, no, I was raised uh, my my parents, my family, my grandparents. They were my mother's parents were Catholic, so they went to church, but nobody else in my family did. Wow, yeah, we we were uh, they were very much like fundamentalist atheists. Okay, you know, like uh, like you have the cartoon Christians that are like just. <laughs> But you have cartoon atheists too. They don't really think through their ideas very deeply. But it was, uh, yeah. So that's that's the environment that I was born into. So, and you know, the relationship I had with, with my mom, that relationship, that first relationship I have was was not good. 
It's not okay. beautiful. It's, it still isn't. And that that's something else too, that um, because of that, it shaped my entire life. And I mean, basically I had a, a fear of rejection mm. that's, that's always there. And, uh, and even though I've worked through it, most of it, it it's like, uh, it's like when you wear a watch and you have a watch on your wrist all the time and you're always checking your time or whatever. And then you take the watch off, but it still yeah, like still it's still like it's there. Yeah. And you're still looking at it, it still feels like it's there. And that's kind of what it is. It was so ingrained in me. It's like, that's sometimes that comes back as that first reaction to something, you know? Um, so, but it isn't, it isn't like I'm a, a victim of that. I don't, I don't look at myself like that at all. It's still there though. I still have to be aware of it because that, that, that creeps up, that fear creeps up in the stories that I'm trying to make better. Yeah. You know, I get pushed up against that fear and it's like, oh, there it is again. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I really enjoyed your, um, your video you did about play. Mm. And, uh, and you mentioned something in that video about it being a healthy relationship, basically be a healthy relationship with play. And yeah. so when I was younger, I didn't have a healthy relationship with play. I, I used humor as a force field mm. so I could keep people away. Like I yeah. never knew who I really was. Yeah, I did the same. And I thought, I thought I heard you say that once. So you understand what I'm saying. And yeah. then I don't, I don't know how old I was, maybe in my early twenties, late teens, early twenties. I, I realized that most of the people that wanted to be around me wanted to laugh. It's like, that was kind of what I attracted this, you know? So it just it, kind of the irony of it is I realized my life was a joke. <laughs> yeah. In, in a very real way. Yes, 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 exactly. And, and I used my humor too, as a weapon a lot. Mm. If somebody tried to get close or try to push me, uh, I could, I could use it as a sword mm. and make other people laugh while I'm doing it. Yes. And so, um, so I, I, I had to learn how to, how to have, have the humor, have the, have the play and that lightheartedness, but in a way that is balanced. I so, have something like that with, um, well, as a kid, I would, my father always told me I was very good at, making such specific comments that could break people. Um, but that would be really funny, you know? Yeah. But it could really break people. That was part of that for me. And I realized that it is really um, a curse and a blessing in a sense, because now I'm learning that that same ability is extremely useful to pinpoint qualities inside of people. So now I comment, uh, compliment people a lot on very specific things that they will remember, because that, that, that works both ways. Yeah. And I think a comedian has a, such an interesting mind. Like some some comedians that I know are so they have they have an impressive mind in the sense of how they pick up patterns in conversation. I mean, to be able to be funny all the time, it, it's it's really yeah. Yeah. it's really wild how fast your brain has to work. Right. Yeah. To um, spot the irony in things. Yeah. And then bring it out. But I I honestly did the same thing. I I could pinpoint something that would bring one person to tears and have 10 other people laughing their head off. Yeah. But it, you know, now that same gift is there. And sometimes I used to still use humor, but it's in a totally different way. Yes. Yes. Same. You know, and same. it's, it's to, um, I can build them up or, or make them make them see their fear or whatever in a way and come alongside them. Like, we're both laughing at it together and I do the same dumb thing, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I thought I had, remember you, you were telling somebody about that before and mm. it's like, my gosh, I did the same thing. Yeah. So what, so what, um, was it insecurity that kind of led you there? Yeah, for sure. I think that yeah. if you, if you're the clown, I think that, it hides your own identity and your vulnerabilities and 
you're always deflecting in a way or you're not really being straight up. And if you're never straight up, they never get to the real you. So okay. they would never hurt the real you if you're always being the jokester. And I guess I have had periods in my life where I was exactly like that. And then I started to hate that so much that I went the exact opposite way for a while. And I'm finding the balance. So for a while, I was like, I only want straight up real interactions. And I was so done with the walking around things and, you know, right. deflecting and all these things. And now I, I, I can I can see the value in in some of that and some of that play, like in a positive sense. So, yeah, it was insecurity that, that, that drove it for sure. Yeah, I'm sure obviously it's from a different source, but it's still there. Yeah, exactly. So we, <clears throat> at least for me, um, I did that overreaction too, you know, um, like a rubber band breaking and then it snaps. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of, kind of find that it's uh, equilibrium but humor is a very useful tool very useful play you know to you know life would be tragic if it weren't so funny yeah and uh you have to see that in it too otherwise uh, it can get really dark yeah and you, you like you were saying about power you know but power is really a reaction. It's a, it's downstream from fear. I yes. Think. At least for me, it is. So, yes. Um, so when you're able to play, you know, you're, you're also uh, able to be in a good relationship with your fear. Yes, exactly. So, so exactly. it's like an indicator that, that you have it at least somewhat under control enough to yeah. function properly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. I think because I'm thinking about sports a lot. For me, sports was completely loaded with fear for the longest time in my life because I was afraid of failing. And then I started to realize that the only way for me to really become good at these sports is to fail. So to incorporate that, then you integrate, you integrate the failure. And by virtue of that, the fear goes away because it's not something to fear if it's a good thing. The only thing I fear is getting injured or something going wrong. But if I stay within the bounds of of the game and I, I do all my preparations right, then I'm, I'm minimizing that. Hmm. So then I don't have to fear them. If it, and if it does happen, I knew that I prepared for it at least. So was there something in your life that you excel that that help you to overcome give you confidence yeah definitely i started lifting weights 15 i i did i did like body weight exercises since i was 13 also driven out of insecurity but it it went from insecurity to pride and then from pride it went to humility and stability that's how that that journey went for me but lifting weights was uh was what saved me i think in my teenage years hmm yeah yeah i had uh, for me it was uh when i went to i actually went to uh technical school for drafting and design and mm -hmm. uh, but I, it was after high school i went i worked for a few years then i i went to school and um really excelled at it and so it built that confidence up yeah and that that is you know early 20s so that that's when it started to really I didn't have to be a clown all the time, but then just like you said, man, the, then the pride comes in. Exactly. You know, because, um, well, you know why <laughs> human, <laughs> human nature. Yeah. But it, uh, and then over time and then, then, then there becomes a, just like an overreaction, just like with the humor, mm -hmm. you know? So you go from insecurity to making it your identity. Yeah. And then that, that ident then your pride that, that all associates together so then it's like it's not my identity it's just something i'm, I'm good at mm. and i can be okay with that and just uh try to uh, that, that i think about that time is when i started to look at at the relationships more for my as my identity you know my anthology what what am i what am i writing what stories am i writing and that's 
that keeps you humble. Yeah. Because you can't control it. You can still, I mean, through the process, I guess if the main thing is you're just kind of available, you're asking God for help. And I think he wants people to be in good relationship. So he kind of grades on a curve, you know, <laughs> and he helps us out yeah. and make sure we succeed at it. Um, at least that's been my experience with it. Yeah. So, so now that, but like I was telling you earlier, like my, my relationship with designing, it's not that important to me anymore because what has replaced that is, is the process of, of writing these stories. I see. So the, the relationships. Yeah. yeah. So have you, have you um, listened to Martin Shaw at all? You know Martin he Shaw. Um, did, is he the guy, does he write movies or something? He, uh, he tells stories. Is he, was he with Peugeot? Myth. Yeah. He's been with Peugeot. He's been on Paul's channel. I think he converted to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Ago. So I listened to the talk with Peugeot. That, that's, that's my only reference. Okay. So he's, he's been someone that I've really, I don't know. He's kind of captured me. I gotta be mm. honest. Uh, really. I just listened to one of his books and he read it himself. Uh, courting the wild twin i think is the name of it okay and uh but that's something i really want to do i i want to i want to tell stories like that sit around a campfire and tell a story yeah. that you know just captures people i think it would be very rewarding do you want so, to tell existing stories or do you want to create your own story maybe maybe both yeah yeah it's because it, i think if you create your own i probably would do existing ones at first until i start to see you know the patterns and things that that work <laughs> and then from there i can maybe start writing my own but i am writing my own in a, in, in these relationships too mm. right so it's kind of the same process it just would be to put it into a story format yeah, my my grandmother, uh, my dad's mom, she used to tell stories. She, oh my gosh, she was such a good storyteller. And she, but they were stories about people from the neighborhood. Mm. And we grew up in a farming uh, community, like the tail end of family farming. That's where, that's when I grew up, and it was so amazing because the stories were people you knew. And so she would tell a story about people, you know, like they did something heroic, but you knew who they were. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah. I really loved, I loved listening to her every time we'd spend the night, which was almost every weekend, she would tell us a story about somebody, you know, or sometimes she'd repeat it from what was amazing to me is how her stories, she'd, she'd tell them and she maybe tell them a year later and it'd be exactly the same. Well, she, 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 she just had a memory yeah. to do that. So, so that's something I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to pursue. I'd like to have campfires at our house, you know, and just invite neighbors and people and like bring a story and, <laughs> and share that's it. That's cool. You know? Yeah. I think that's very important as well. I'm starting to realize I never thought about it this way, but I mean, we're so obsessed with TV shows and movies. They're all stories. I forgot about that. To yeah. me, it's just entertainment, you know, like you just consume right. it. You don't even think about it, but it's like, oh yeah, actually we're obsessed with stories but we also have our own and i guess if they don't help you make your own stories better then you should act differently toward them because now i love huh i'm actually there i've been there for a while actually yeah. just trying to think is this is this something that that is going to make these stories in my life better and yeah how and and sometimes there's a little bit in there some something that you can a little nugget you can take out and and sometimes there isn't you know um but our, our relationship with a lot of things uh like music and it's very cons a consuming attitude mm. uh, i don't think you know if you think about like pornography mm. it's pretty easy to see where there's a benefit without any kind of effort um, yeah it's designed know, so you, that way 
you don't have to you don't have to have the relationship but you get the reward from it but when i say it like that and then you start applying it to music it's like auditory porn it can make you feel like if you listen to a love song a girl can listen, you know it's like make her feel in love without yes yes being exactly in love, right and not that not, i'm not saying that it's bad though because i'm not i'm not like a person that is like a puritan and you know you can't that's that's not what i mean it's more you just have to have a healthy relationship with it mm. and understand that it's there but it's more to bring it into your story so that it points to something higher how do i integrate it how, how to i how do i use this in a way that makes the world around me good true and beautiful yeah and when you th then consumption as a whole it changes because you're i know you you've been talking about ai and uh have you have you talked about Neuralink at all with anybody yeah yeah i think i heard you talking about that too so what what do you think elon's goal is with Neuralink? well i think that elon is living a story of there are inevitabilities in terms of the technology technological development and I don't trust the people that would lead that. So perhaps I should be the one to do it. Um, but I mean, he's, he's birthing these things himself, right? Perhaps yeah. without him, they wouldn't even happen uh, as fast as for sure. But what he wants to do, I think he wants, well, I, I don't know if I can trust him, but I'm quick to, well, I don't know if I'm quick to trust people, but I've listened enough to Elon to be like, okay, I actually don't think he's a bad man um i think he wants to help people i just think he has no idea or maybe he does but it <laughs> yeah, seems hard. to me he, he has no idea the gravity of this development what it what it could mean but i i it seems to be that he has good intentions i don't know him personally so i couldn't say for sure but i i trust enough people that trust him to to say that yeah and I, I, I feel the same way about him. I think that he does have good intentions. I, I'm not sure like with the Neuralink, because I've heard him discuss that in the context of AI, where he was saying, basically, if humans don't have this, we won't be able to compete with AI. Mm. I that, see. That's, that's, a, that's actually an angle I hadn't heard before. So that's interesting. And, and that, uh, so it would be a way to, upload and download information without the bottleneck of a keyboard uh-huh so he sees that as the bottleneck okay is the information the, the the bandwidth basically mm. of, of the information coming in and out and uh i'm not i don't think that's i don't think that's the bottleneck i think the bottleneck is writing our stories mm. because there's a there's a pace to them some stories take decades like the story it almost seems like the story has to trust you enough to reveal itself fully to you and it takes a long time for it to plan yeah. you know to play out um because we have all the information we need it's it's taking it and applying it that's the issue or not even knowing we need to maybe is even a bigger issue but if we if you do come to the place place of growth and understanding relationship and you try to apply it, it's not a fast process. It's like it's like growing a garden. Yeah. So you can you can have the information on how to plant a garden and put the seeds in and you can do it very efficiently, but then it has to grow. And that's not something you can control. No. I agree with you. So I think AI kind of is it's and maybe the neural link too. I'm not sure. It's going to, it's going to feed the consumption more. Yeah. But not, not help with the application. No. And it seems to consume itself even to, to, to that degree. I, earlier in the conversation, we were speaking about how these new developments, technological developments engender new relationships. So we have now, now we have relationships to these things, right? Like I have a relationship to my phone and I have a relationship to this and that. And I'm wondering, perhaps we should just not have relationships with 
a certain level of technology. Like there should, I think there should be a boundary in my own life. Some things I just don't need. Like I need food, of course. I need food. Do I need to have a, what they call it, Apple Vision thing? I don't think so. I think right. I should just not create that relation. I think there's just a limit. And we're touch, We're now for, for the first time really touching that limit and going beyond it where it's, there, there's just no way that some of these things are going to help us. I don't know. If, I don't know if this is the right way to approach it, but I'll share it because you brought it up. Like my, my relationship with technology is, so I have, I have neighbors that are Amish hmm. and I've got to be really good friends with several of them. And uh, we talk about technology wow. and, religion and we have really good conversations and so i was asking him about where they stand with certain technologies and stuff and he said something that like really stuck with me he said uh we reject the technologies that would give us the illusion of being independent mm, that's interesting and i thought that was interesting too because i had never heard that before i mean you, you kind of i've talked to other amish and there's there's different branches of of the amish faith so they're not all the same so this group that's by us is different than the ones i grew up by but they have that different attitude towards technology and so i kind of tried to think well how do i basically they don't want technology to destroy the community so you yeah. don't want to grab hold of technology and lose the community you don't want mm -hmm. to lose the stories that you're trying to write so I limit the technology. If it starts affecting the, the real stories that I'm trying to write, then I, that's, that's where the line is. That's where the boundary is for me. And sometimes, uh, boy, I mean, things happen in life and you have four or five stories you need to attend to. And there's, you know, there's a lot of time that goes into that and that's what gets the priority. So yeah. now I have found, you know, some, some relationship online, uh, but generally it's not as, not as deep as no, it can be in not. person, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I limit that too, because it's like, I'm not chasing quantity more quality. Yeah. Same. So I'll, I'd rather have, you know, 10 really good relationships and a few online and that that's enough that takes all my attention. I don't need to really pursue much more. Yeah. And I don't know about, you know, chasing. I, I did make some videos and I, I took them down. It's just like, it's just not me. Mm, <laughs> I don't know. I, I see. don't know why, but um, everyone's different too. You know, Yeah. it's like, I, I know my, I know, I know my strengths. Like you, you even brought those up a little bit about being able to see the specifics and the details and, I have the ability to help people work through their fear that that, I mean, I probably do that with people more than anything else. And, um, that's, that's harder to do online mm. for me because it's hard to really read the situation. Well, yeah. Um, uh, 80% of communications nonverbal. Exactly. So when we're, when we're using video chat, that improves that there, you know, there's more communication going on than if we were just talking on a phone and that's more than if it were emails and texting, you know? So there's all these degrees of separation, but, um, I just don't, I don't pick up as much through a, a video chat than I would in real life, not even close really. So it makes it harder to really, I guess, be in that dance, you know, and help, help someone through the chaos that they're in yeah but that's but good I still, to find it out I, I still try you know sometimes somebody needs it mm -hmm. but uh and then sometimes you can offer it and people don't want it they don't you know i don't know yeah. if you run it if you run into that but that that's something that's uh well that plays into my fear of rejection too <laughs> it's kind of funny it's funny how i act sometimes even though you know going into something, you know, but when you actually face it, it's like, ugh, you know, I, I'm trying to reach this person and they don't want, 
your help yeah. or whatever. So I got to like say, God, this is something you led me to do. I'm going to leave this fruit here at their feet and whatever they do with it, they do with it. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't take it personal. You know? I see. Yeah. I feel the same way. I think that rejection is, well, you told me that it's from a very early child, uh, early age. Yeah. So perhaps that's built into a degree that you can't get rid of it. But I, for me, I didn't have that, um, from an early age, but I did, it did develop for me. Mm -hmm. And I came over it by just being rejected a lot. <laughs> it just helped me so it. <laughs> Yeah, I get to, well, it's just, I, I started to realize that I shouldn't expect to be accepted. For me, the, I, I turned it around being like, okay, the expectation is actually rejection. That's why I like for, for podcasts, for example, reaching out to, to people, um, I knew off the bat when I started this thing that I was mostly going to get rejections and I, I don't mind that. It's just, right. I understand. It's all good. Yeah. So you have a relationship with your goal, with your expectation yeah. and that, and it doesn't have as much power. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's exactly what I've done too. Uh, it, it's still though, every once in a while it creeps up on me. Like I yeah, said, I you just, you don't understand, you don't expect it to, but it does. So I think, uh, you know, being aware of things like that is the biggest hurdle, mm. you know? Yeah. And really how to, how to, uh, how to accept it, but you're right. You, you kind of, you kind of just have to, you can't live in fear. You can't, you know, fear of rejection is like terrible. Yeah. I see, I, you know, I see a lot of people though that struggle with that so much, yeah. so much. Maybe that's I might be sensitive to it. Mm. So I see it more too. I don't know. Because yeah, that could be. I think you, when you go through something, you are, you have higher empathy towards people that are going through it. You yeah, of course. Then perhaps that's also something you, you're given in a sense that you have this heightened ability to see it in others. And then right. perhaps it's something you can help them with. I think that's exactly how God re redeems it. It's like, yeah. that, that's how he brings it to use in his kingdom. Come, you know, Yeah. it's like, he wants me to see it. So I went through it so I can see it so I can help them get, get over it, mm -hmm. their fear too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's, uh, <sighs> so what do you, what do you think about the, um, the idea of being born from above? We kind of glossed over that a little yes. bit, but I wanted to know what you thought of that. Cause that's that I think in the Bible, the way born again can be translated either way. It's born either again, born again or born, again from, or born above. from above. I like so, it. I think it's deeply tied to, to baptism in the sense that it's well, for Vicky says that this is kind of a well revolutionary way of thinking. Paul starts to use it of that he's now a new Paul, you know, change his name. Mm -hmm. I think that it is beautiful that this is now an option. I don't know if it was an option before that time, if you know what I mean. You're right. And so for me, it's, um, I almost think you can be born from above multiple times a day, a minute, even. <laughs> In a sense, you know, like for me, it's attaining to to a higher self every time, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. That's a way of interpreting it, but perhaps it's a more specific concept that is that is a one time thing. But because you were you were mentioning it in in relationship to your well, you were born with your mother, and then the father comes in and then you can be born from above when the relationship is right. Do I get that correctly? Yeah. So we're born from material. Yeah. And then we're born from above later. I guess what I, I was wondering too, is like, for me, I don't think that you it's, you don't let go of the material though. No, it's, it, it's, it's, you're born from above, but you're, you're still material. Yes. So you're the union of heaven and earth. Yeah. So that, and I've, I've wondered, like, is that, is that part of the reason why Christians um, kind of reject the material world? 
like as far as um, being in relation with it, it's like being born again, replaced being born from material. So it's like that. It, it, it's separate it's separate now. yeah it, it feels a bit gnostic that the the idea that this world is somehow lower um whereas i think it's imbued with with god but yes. the gnostic idea is that we live up in that higher reality and we should just attain to that it's maybe a, a way of you know transcending it but i think the way you can really harmonize is to also have the material and then you connect it to right that's how i that's how i see it but i wasn't raised in a christian church so people i know that were it seems like that's kind of uh embedded in them i don't know um not all denominations either though some some seem more accepting of of the union of heaven and earth and others are more like it's you're off floating <laughs> yeah uh, somewhere else now like you leave the world behind yes yeah. yes i was close to that as well i was close to both <laughs> oh you explored them yeah, yeah. So, I, I gotta be honest yeah so was i you know I, I i really got caught up in that and that's that's how i became aware of it the one church i was going to they were very much into that like you're born again you know and, and this world isn't something you should partake in yes you know, and it's like, uh, it's, that's not, that's not where I ended up though. It's like, I, I was still tethered to the material world and it's like, it's so beautiful and there's so much there it offers us why, you know, at least in this body or while we're here, we're part of it. Yeah. And then that gives you a sense of stewardship over it mm -hmm. that you want to take care of it, I guess. Yeah. And you have so, that above that can help you with that. Right. Otherwise we'd just be left to our animal animalistic tendencies, you know? So if there's, if there's a being born from above, I think there's, and you, I like the way you said it. Cause I think there's, there's degrees of it too, because if somebody is very materialistic, like an, like an atheist would be, um, like my family was very much that way. And, and so the relationships, everything, everything is looked at from the material point of view. So they don't have that, that higher understanding of the relationship. The things you can't see is actually what holds everything together. That, that That's the, yeah. that's what binds everything and ties everything together. And that, um, cause I, I, a guy used to ask them questions like that you know it's like well what about the things you can't see and i didn't really get any good answers from them you know yeah. they kind of lived in the so they separated themselves the other way more like yeah. it was yeah. just complete, completely material yeah so the opposite of gnostics yeah. yeah so materialism in a sense i guess so I think I would love to hear what some of your, like your brother, some of your friends that you talk to stuff on and stuff, think about some of, some of these things, like how, how we are a collection of stories and how we can make them better. Cause I think they're on the same path, aren't they? Yeah. they they're, they're looking, they're looking to how, how do we bring this into our lives? Mm -hmm. at least i see that in both of them yeah i think so so I'd be curious to see what they think about it yeah I, if, if they're listening i'd love to hear it from them mm -hmm. um i'm actually going to well i'm going to a physio and she's a horse physio okay. i wanted to bring that in because i'm i have to leave very soon sadly but oh. I, that'd be interesting to speak to you about that because <laughs> my dad's back is hurting a lot and there was no physio available so and then he found this lady who does uh, horseback riders and horses, and she analyzes yeah. their you know their movement patterns and. Is that like massage therapy or something? Or well, no, it? she's an actual physiotherapist. So okay. Then she she corrects certain things and anyway he had trouble in his back and they couldn't locate the problem and they kept looking at the back and then 
uh, basically she found out that it's a whole different issue. So it wasn't the back at all. She's like, no, it, instantly she saw him because she, she understands the body in a holistic manner. She's like, oh no, it's the, you have the feet and you have the, the pelvis there. There's an issue there. Um, more relationships a relationship exactly <laughs> she she saw the the entirety of the story she didn't just see one of the parts whereas a lot of people just look at the part of the back they don't realize it's an intertwined web of connectedness and mm -hmm. fertility so that's yeah that's really cool um but anyway so i located a problem for myself like a small problem that i have in my pelvis as well and uh and i'm going by there so well, i hope it works out for you is that something <laughs> so you too. that probably you might have repeat visits yeah well she, don't know. she says she wants to be done in one one session with me so we'll see okay well, <laughs> i hope it works out for you me too it's uh it's an absolute joy and a pleasure to to speak to you this way i mean you've you've commented so many times and i listened to a lot of your talks with um with karen and initially i just listened to the one about like austrian economics and stuff like that but now I realize that there's such a depth and it's um, it's really special to be able to to experience that and see similarities in our own stories mm -hmm. and that you have these these ideas. It's really, it's cool. I don't have them. I never do. But uh, to have people like you on, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really cool and inspiring and I can play with them. So that's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was great. Thank you very much for the opportunity and um, we'll do it again. So yeah, we can talk do. about... Uh, we can talk about money. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about money. Hopefully, we'll do it in a balanced way. Above yeah. and below. <laughs> right, right. Thank you so That's much good. for your time, Brad. I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank Have you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye.